So the power of persistence, the power of persistent prayer, how about that? There was a hesitant driver that was waiting on a traffic jam to clear, came to a stop at express ramp. Maybe you've experienced something like this before. The traffic thinned out, but the timid driver still waited. Finally, an infuriated voice came from behind shouting, The sign says yield! Don't give up! Has that been you before? Yeah. You know, people are merging in, and you're just driving, and you know you're going on along, and they're merging in, and you're like, I'm not getting out of the way. You're supposed to merge in. I've got the right of way here. I'm not slowing down for you, but yet you either slow down or you're going to hit them because you know how it is. The primary actors in today's parable neither yielded nor gave up. In fact, the lesson in these two parables is all about the power of persistence. Jesus told these two parables with almost identical messages about persistence. The only difference in these stories really is the setting. They make the same point. The first story is recorded in Luke chapter 11, verse 5 through 13. And Jesus told this parable just after teaching the disciples how to pray, using the prayer that we just prayed, the Lord's Prayer. We can imagine the parable answering a question from Peter. Master, should we really bother God with small concerns like our daily bread? Jesus answered such a thought, spoken or unspoken, with the story right out of the experiences of everyday life, the parable of the friend at midnight. Both Jesus and his listeners would have enjoyed the humor of this story. So I'm going to tell it in a little more contemporary style. Once upon a time, a traveler arrived at his friend's house at midnight. Perhaps he had been traveling at night to escape the hot sun of Palestine. Perhaps he had been delayed by business, a mishap of some kind, or to stop to help someone along the way. In any case, he was not expected, but he knew his friend would give him a place to sleep for the night. The friend, in the best traditions of Eastern hospitality, would not dream of sending a guest to bed without food. However... He was caught unprepared without a crumb in the house. So he went at once to his neighbor's house and began to knock on the door to call out, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. The neighbor walked out of a sound sleep, was anything but sympathetic. He and his wife and children were asleep on their sleeping mats in a little one-room house. Now, typical homes back then were one room, okay? The front two-thirds was a dirt floor where the animals were kept at night. The back one-third was an elevated platform where the family slept together. The door was open during the day because this was the culture of hospitality, and they didn't have anything really to steal. But they would lock it at night or at least close it at night when they went to sleep. Boy, we wouldn't dream of doing that today, would we? Leaving our doors open. But there was a time. Raise your hand if there was a time that you kept your doors unlocked. Was there a time? You, you remember that? Your families? We never locked our doors when I was growing up. There was no security system. The church that I was a part of, they never locked the doors of the church. I could go by there any time, shoot basketball outside on the goal, go in the church, use the water fountain, use the bathroom. It was always open. Not anymore. This doesn't happen, does it? So this is the setting for this story. He and his wife and his children were asleep on their sleeping mats in the little one-room house. Maybe the baby had been teething and had just fallen asleep. At any rate, the neighbor said, in effect, what do you mean by waking me up and my family at this hour? Before you know it, you'll wake the children up, you'll wake the neighbors up, go away. I won't stumble around in the dark trying to find loaves of bread for you. Nevertheless, his friend continued to knock over and over and over to ask for that bread. We can imagine the neighbor finally saying, Okay, okay, don't wake up the whole neighborhood. I'm getting up. I'll get the bread. The second story of persistence has no humor about it. It tells of a judge who neither feared God nor regarded man. What kind of judge is that? A poor widow kept coming to him for justice again and again against her adversary. 
Since the widow brought her case before a single judge rather than before a jury, it was probably a money matter, perhaps a debt, a pledge, a portion of her inheritance was being withheld from her. Scripture speaks frequently of the plight of widows, their poverty and exploitation. They often, too, suffered. This widow evidently had no influence, no one to speak for her, and no money with which to bribe the judge. Yet she kept returning again and again, pleading with him to hear her case. Scripture is very clear about the judge's motive for his action when he finally acted on the widow's behalf. It says that though the judge cared nothing about the justice or about the widow, he vindicated her in order to get rid of her. Her persistence wore him down. In both parables, in both instances, the reluctant neighbor and the unjust judge did the decent thing because it was the least bothersome thing to do. They didn't do it out of love or mercy or justice. They did it because they were badgered. Jesus is making a point here that with resistance can be battered down by sheer persistence. He's also making the point that if it's true with the not-so-admirable persons, How much more may we expect God to respond to us as we keep our needs before Him? So let's glean some significant truths from the parables. If goodness, and this is a slide for you to look at, it's in your notes as well. If goodness is produced by less than righteous, even evil powers, we can expect limitless goodness from God. Jesus says it very clearly in the passage recorded in Luke chapter 11, verses 11 through 13, he set the stage by asking the disciples a question. Those of you who are fathers, if your son asks you for some fish to eat, would you give him a scorpion? Then Jesus made his telling point. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Matthew records the same sayings of Jesus, but with a different ending. How much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? Matthew 7, 11. We talk a lot about the mystery of evil. What about the mystery of goodness? We receive daily the gifts of God's grace, poured out freely without regard for our merit. God still makes the sun shine on the evil and the good. And the rain fall on the unjust and the unjust. But even more mysterious is God's Spirit at work bringing good out of the actions of weak, fallible, and sinful human beings. Joseph, remember Joseph in the Bible? Joseph recognized that mystery when he confronted his brothers who had sold him into slavery in Egypt. Joseph said, You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Read that story in Genesis chapter 50 if you're not familiar with the story of Joseph. In 1954, Harper and Brothers published a collection of testimonies from German refugees who were expelled from their homes by the victors in World War II and had to travel without food or clothing through what was enemy territory. Yet these testimonies tell of unexpected kindness and protection and mercy shown by their enemies. Indeed, there were instances where enemies actually risked their lives to care for people whose nations, soldiers, had invaded in their land. How rarely do acts of kindness, mercy, and generosity become news. We live in a time, and you know this, we live in a time where newspaper, headlines, Television news shows are dominated by stories about deceit, selfishness, immorality, corruption, catastrophe, murder, rape, hatred, suspicion. Through some perverted sense of the dramatic, it is assumed that evil alone is news. And yet, isn't it amazing, less than two weeks ago, for a full week, There was some good news. You see, there were something like 13 million people that were planning to tune in and watch a football game, and it turned into a gigantic prayer meeting. And before you know it, that 13 million tripled. 
people heard that something had happened to a man on the football field and his heart had stopped, and they were tuning in, wanting to know, what happened? Is he okay? What's going on? And they turn on their TV, some people that don't even care about football, and they see 300-pound linemen on their knees crying and praying. And then people are looking on their phones and they're scrolling to find out more information all during the week. News and media, it's all about prayer and all about hope. And for a moment, if just for a brief time, it's not all about murder and suspicion and rape and sex trafficking, all that stuff that just dominates the media. For a moment, it was about the great need that we have for prayer and for God in our nation. And there didn't seem to be much opposition, did there? Isn't that interesting? To be sure, if we know our own hearts, we know our own hearts, we cannot deny the existence of evil. But we cannot deny the presence of goodness either. Where does this come from? This goodness, this decency, this humanity. We saw humanity, real humanity, didn't we, with what happened on a Monday night football game. Last night, I was watching some of the Hawks game, the Atlanta Hawks. You know who they are? They were up by 19 points in the third quarter. I said, man, this is going to be their sixth game in a row. This is great. I go in to get a little snack. It's just a small one, by the way, because I'm doing a soul fast, so it's got to be small. And I get this little snack, and I wanted a bigger one, but I got a small one. And I go back in, and the game is tied. I was like, wait a minute. In four minutes, they've lost a 19-point lead? What is this? And then there was a moment where there was a timeout, and there was an interview with a young lady that was there. She's, she's famous. She lives here in Atlanta. I had never heard of her before, but she has a new movie out. And the girl at the game interviewed her and said, what do you like about coming to a Hawks game? And she said, well, you know, it's the first time I've ever been to a Hawks game, and I'm a native of Atlanta. And she was like, really? She said, and it's wonderful. She says, all these people together, there's a great spirit of unity. We're enjoying the game. We're cheering together. We're high-fiving, except when they lost a 19-point lead. (laughs) And I thought for a moment, you see what God has done? He's brought us together, hasn't he? And how long will it last? We don't need to stop praying, do we? We don't need to stop witnessing and and sharing the goodness that God has placed in our lives with others. This needs to continue. You know, and our media out there could help with that, couldn't they? With interviews and continue to feature this man's recovery and how that happened and interviewing these coaches and these players to keep that theme going, the persistence of prayer, and our need for God. It just proves, folks, it doesn't matter how much influence you have, how much money you had, that had nothing to do with bringing that man back to life, did it? It took CPR and the grace of God and prayer and really good doctors to do that. I was talking with a woman not long ago. She's in chronic back pain. She's struggling all the days of her life. She has limitless funds. She's been to every single expert. And she says, the only relief I have found is not in any of that. She says, it's getting on my knees as hard as it is because of my back and praying to the Lord. He's the one that gives me hope. He's the one that gives me relief. And those who love me, who support me, who are writing me and texting me and bringing me meals, that's the body of Christ. You see, we cannot through this life alone, and we need the Lord to manifest himself right now in our world. And we need to persistent, be persistent about that. There was a, a violin teacher, though not very successful, who had a great deal of wisdom that was refreshing. A friend called on him one day and said, Well, what's the good news today? The old music teacher went over to a tuning fork suspended by a cord, and struck it with a mallet. There's the good news for today, he said. That, my friend, is A. That was A all day yesterday. It will be A all day tomorrow, next week, and for a thousand years. The sopranos upstairs, the soprano upstairs, Upstairs, warbles off key. The tenor next door flats his high notes. The piano across the hall is out of tune. 
Noise all around me, noise. But that, my friend, she said, is an A. Jesus is telling us something like this in these parables. You and I are not always good, but God is. God is good all the time. There's a second lesson from the parables that is not primary, but it's a lesson well worth paying attention to. Sometimes we're made better in spite of ourselves. You know that, don't you? We're made better in spite of ourselves. The unjust judge didn't want to be good. The reluctant neighbor didn't want to be good. They were made good, or at any rate, they did something that was good in spite of themselves. We talk too much about guilt by association. We ought to talk more about goodness or virtue by association. It works both ways. Wise persons will seek the kind of friends who lift them up and encourage them to be their best, to set high standards, and to give themselves unselfishly to others. Our companions rub off on us. Many people can bear witness to the fact that their lives have been lived on a little higher plane than would have been possible had it not been for the example and encouragement of a friend. I believe most of us can testify to that. At every level of life, we find people responding to the circumstances in which they find themselves being better in spite of themselves. I told the leadership team on Friday night, that they are made better because of their spouses and that they, the leadership team, are to lead out of their marriages, that they need to be faithful, that they need to be pure, that they need to be holy, that they need to be shepherds of their spouses, of their family. And as a leadership team, we are to shepherd the church. That's our main objective. Yes, there's a lot of business stuff and a lot of decisions that have to be made, but if we're failing to shepherd you, then we have failed enormously. That's why this congregational care ministry that you'll read about in your insert today, next week we're going to have a sign-up for that, is so important that we are caring for one another, helping each other through this life. When the steamship Halifax was in a collision at sea just, at the co- just off the coast of Massachusetts, a fire broke out on board. Many of the crew members deserted their posts, terrorized passengers. They leaped into the water, but a deckhand saved the day. He went into the deserted engine room where he had no obligation to be, and he put out the blaze. During the formal investigation that followed, he was asked if there wasn't a great deal of smoke in the engine room. He replied, oh, yes, there was a lot of smoke. Didn't you realize that it was dangerous for you to stay there, he asked. I don't know, sir, he replied. I was not the judge of that. But you stayed, didn't you? He answered, yes, I did. And when he was pressed to say whether he stayed out of a sense of duty or simply because he didn't know what else to do, he replied with quite dignity, I saw that someone was needed there. I saw that someone was needed there. We can expect limitless goodness from God. And let's remember that sometimes we're made better in spite of ourselves. We have yet to come to the core truth of this parable. Neither the judge nor the reluctant neighbor is the central actor in this drama. The spotlight must be kept on the widow and the fellow who had an unexpected guest drop in at midnight. And the lesson centers on the power of persistence. The specific point has to do with prayer. Both parables immediately follow the request of the disciples for Jesus to teach them how to pray. So Jesus is teaching us about prayer, and I believe he's saying at least three things. And here they are, and you've got them today, and it would behoove you to etch these on your heart today. Sincere prayer is always answered. Sincere prayer is always answered. And let me say this to you. It may not be the way that you want it to be answered. But God has his own way, okay? And his ways are always better. Persistent prayers are always answered. Persistent prayer. Prayers that voice our deepest needs in keeping with God's will are always answered. Remember those. Note that Jesus does not picture 
either the unjust judge nor the reluctant neighbor as a symbol or a metaphor for God. He's not teaching us about the nature of God. He's teaching us about the nature of our praying. Sincerity, persistence, the voicing of our deepest need in keeping with God's will. That's what prayer is all about. Many of us would be embarrassed to knock on a neighbor's door at midnight. But the parable of the friend at midnight tells us that we can call on God at any time. We can. I told Judy Bordoon. I told her, she knows this, she's here this morning. I said, you can call on me at any time. It doesn't matter. And you can too. I'm your pastor. I'm your shepherd. I'm your friend. If you need me, call. If I need you, you're going to be there for me, right? I need you. I know you say you need me, but I need you. I promise you. I need you. It's very important. I need all of you. We'd be reluctant to do that, to knock on the door at midnight. Many of us would be reluctant to admit that we hadn't been prepared for the very small emergency posed by the arrival of just one expected guest. Many of us hesitate to pray when we know we're at fault and have done nothing we should have done to remedy the situation. But this parable tells us to ask God's help no matter what we have done or what we have failed to do. Many of us quickly take one no or even a maybe as a final answer to any request. Both parables we are studying this morning in this chapter tell us to persist, to keep on asking and seeking and knocking until we receive what God wants to give us. Persistence is what we need to do. Prayer gives God the opportunity to meet our needs. If we're not praying, it's amazing. He still meets our needs. But we need to be praying, folks. The more we know about human psychology, physiology, the better we're able to appreciate Jesus' wisdom in insisting on persistence. How often do we approach the issues of life in a state that could only be described as self-conscious, half awake, half alive, or half aware? There may be some things we can do that way, but prayer is not one of them. Being half-hearted in your marriage is not going to work. Being a half-hearted parent is not going to work. Being a half-hearted athlete or musician, teacher, is not going to work. Jesus spent long hours in prayer wrestling with God's will for his life and seeking the strength he needed to live out that will. Jesus did. He wrestled with his calling, with his purpose, with going to the cross. That's his humanity. I believe it was intended that way for you and I to realize, hey, God's big enough. He understands that you're wrestling, that you have your doubts, but be persistent. Jacob wrestled with the angel at the fort of the Jabbok. David repented and he fasted and he lay upon the ground all night long praying for God for the life of his child. The psalmist cried out to God in praise and lament. The prophets cried out to God in a way that we might come nearer to labeling confrontation than prayer. There seems to be written in the nature of our relationship with God the necessity for us to pray wholeheartedly in order for God to be able to answer our prayers. The same is true of everything else that's important in life, of everything that we desperately want to achieve, of everything that we hold as valuable. These things do not come to us by half-conscious, half-hearted efforts. They come to us through persistence. If I want my marriage to be very strong, my relationships to be strong, I'm going to be persistent. I'm not going to take for granted my spouse or my friend's I'm going to validate them, and I'm going to love on them and appreciate them. They're going to know that they're important, that I'm, I'm, they're valuable to me. I'm going to see them personally, visit them, talk to them, call them, physically face-to-face -face with them. If our commitments are great enough, if we 
if what we seek to achieve is important enough, if we really want to be effective in witness, if we want to be disciples worthy of the name of Jesus, we must keep at it. Persistence is the key. You don't just say, yes, I receive you, Jesus. I love you. Thank you. It's not just that. It's a daily discipline of following in his footsteps, of being discipled, of getting involved in a Bible study, a prayer group, a youth group where you have accountability and people to pray with you and, and guide you. It's important, folks. The next time you're tempted to give up, remember this. Life rewards persistence. Another knock on the door may awaken the reluctant neighbor. Another session of persistent prayer may be the key to new understanding, new directions, renewed strength of will, and energizing inspiration. Life rewards persistence. Make sure that you're doing everything that you can, that you're doing the possible of reaching others for Jesus. Sow the seed and let him do the impossible, working on that calloused heart of that person. You don't give up. 2 Corinthians 15, 58 is a beautiful example of all of this. It says, Be ye therefore steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the labors of the Lord, knowing that your labors are not in vain if they are in the Lord. Miss Kim said to us this morning at Youth Sunday School, before she puts her feet on the floor, Lord, Direct my path today. I'm going to encounter a whole lot of things. Would you go ahead and go before me? Basically what she says. And then she has some scripture that comes up on her phone. She has some devotion time before she begins her day of taking care of all of these kids, working two jobs. Her focus on God is the most important. Persistence in that relationship. I love what Brianna said as she is doing this first 15 on her phone, which we had all the youth download on their phones. 15 minutes will probably lead to more time than that because once you taste and see how good God is in that 15 minutes, you want some more. You want more and you want more of that. And it's a beautiful thing to witness within our young people. We should not assume, I want you to hear this. We should not assume that we know the best answer to our prayers. We think we do, don't we? Well, if God would just do this, if he would just answer my prayer like this, Man, I'll do anything for you, Lord. If you'll just do it like this, do it the way I want it, the way I like it, then we'll be good. We should not assume that we know the best answer to our prayers, but we should expect that our Father does and trust Him to do what results in His greatest glory and our greatest good. So you have a little exercise this morning you get to do. In most of your seats there, there's a little postcard. I'm not sure the front row got one. But all the other rows got a little index card. Should have one there. And in the back of your seat, every other seat, there's a pen there. What I want you to do, just take a few moments while Doug is playing here. We're, we're doing great on time this morning. I want you, first of all, to write your name, first and last name on that card. Okay? What you have there? If you don't have one, if you don't have a card, let... Raise your hand, and we'll have our ushers to bring you a card. So on that card, if you got any extra hand, Tommy one back there. I've got an extra on the road. Tommy needs a card. Yeah. Okay, great. On that card, write your name. If you don't mind, you don't have to do this. Some form of contact information. This isn't going out to the whole church, by the way. If it's be the best way to contact you. And I want you to write on there. Summarize it. What's your greatest need for prayer right now? What is it? Be real, okay? I will admit, one other person may see that card, but that'll probably be the only, only one other person. And you may not even know who's going to see it. But I want you to do this. This is congregational care. Write on there whatever it is. You know, if it's something to do with your parents, it's something to do with a job, it's something to do with pain that you're experiencing. If you want to write unspoken, that's okay too. And as you're doing that, in a few moments, our ushers are going to come and they're going to take those cards. They're going to shuffle them like a card deck. And as you're exiting today, they're going to rehand those cards out. You're going to get a different card. It's not going to be your card. If you get your own card, exchange it, okay? 
what we'd like for you to do, and I'm so thankful for Nancy McCord. I'm going to just say this about Nancy McCord and Scott McCord. Those are spiritual people. They are so in touch and in tune with the Lord, it humbles me that they're in our church for what they do for the cause of Christ and the mission work that they've done over the years and feeding the hungry and all that they continue to do. There's a whole gamut of things because they love serving. She sent me a text and said, our grandson is doing the 21 days of prayer and fasting and, and they have decided to pray for folks, like two or three people for 21 days. Well, we don't have 21 days left in our fast. Then we got like till next Sunday. But what I want you to do with whatever card that you get, whosever name you get, I want you to pray for whatever they've written on there. But I want you to pray about how God leads you to connect with that person. Whether you're going to call them or you're going to text them or email them. God may even take you to a higher place than that. To where you go and meet up with that person for coffee. Or get here a little early before Sunday school or church and meet with them. To have a time of connection. you got a whole week to do that. Pray about how God leads you to do that. Don't do the easy thing, okay? Do the thing that takes you out of your comfort zone to provide care for that person, that card that you get. You think you can do that? I think you can. All right, now if you pass your cards in, if you're finished, pass your cards to the end of your row and our ushers will come by. If you're not finished, you can just hand them to the ushers when you go to leave. That's fine. Put your pen back in the back of the seat there. If we're going to teach you about prayer and you not pray, what's the, what's the purpose of it? I hope this will be a discipline that helps you continually pray for other people, to be an intercessor. There's a group of folks in this church that gather every Thursday night at the Shamless Home for a power of prayer. That group can be anywhere from four to like 25 people. It all depends. And it's a time of prayer. We pray for you. We pray for the needs of our congregation and our community. And we have seen, literally, God move mountains through that prayer group, haven't we? If you want to be a part of that, we'd love for you to join us. But whether you do or not, just know that you're being prayed for. You don't even know it. Now you do. We're praying for you. And if you've got requests and things you need praying for, let us know. Tell us. We want to pray for you and lift you up. Continue to be persistent. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your goodness. It's so evident. It's all around us. And Lord, we, we ask you this morning to inspire us on what to do next with these prayer cards that we'll receive at the conclusion of the service today. The person's name we receive and their request, Lord. How would you respond to that need? May we be your eyes, your ears. May you give us your thoughts. May you give us your resolve on how to move forward in prayer. We love you and we adore you in Jesus' name. Amen.